Okay, so let me just open. So our, our presentation is titled The Superiority of the New Covenant. All right. Uh, we have discussed in class and we hope uh, that we agreed that the main idea of the whole book of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ. And in this particular topic, we attempt to focus on the new covenant which Christ mediates, especially as compared to all things that preceded him. And we attempt to answer, sorry, yeah. Yeah, we attempt to answer why is the new covenant superior? And so what if the new covenant is superior? <clears throat> so this will be the agenda uh, for, for today. So let me just go ahead to... So which uh, old one? Okay, before comparing the new covenant with the old, it is vital to clarify the meaning and the scope of the old covenant. This is especially important because the term Old Covenant and the term Old Testament are often confused and because there are multiple covenants in the Old Testament. The big, the big question is then, does the Old Covenant cover all the covenants in the Old Testament or does it cover only a specific covenant or a few specific covenants in the Old Testament? The New Covenant threats in Hebrews <coughs> start in chapter 3, where Jesus is compared to Moses and found to be more superior than Moses. Uh, what follows are four particular motives. Sacrifice, Levitical high priest, sanctuary and tent, and the law. The fact that it starts with comparison with Moses and followed by motives that are specifically characteristics of the covenant with Moses shows that the old covenant in Hebrews specifically refers to the covenant with Moses or sometimes known as the Mosaic covenant or the Sinaitic covenant. So now we will go uh, with the similarities. We will start comparing, but we will start with the similarities between the old covenant and the new covenant. Hello. Um, I would like to start the similarities between old covenant and new covenant. Um, there is similarities and there is dissimilarities. First, I would like to start from the similarities. Uh, what is the similarities? Is it any similarities? But I would, uh, yes, there is some similarities. First similarity, uh, first thing I, am, I would like to say about the appointment as a high priest. In the, in the old covenant and new covenant, priests are appointed by God. In the book of Exodus, nine, chapter 19, verse 24, in the book of Numbers, chapter 3, verse 10, verse 10, it's clearly explained and clearly proves that the priest appointed by the God. The priesthood belongs from the tribe of Levites. God appointed Moses and anointed Aaron as a high priest and, high, and his sons as priests. In the book of Hebrew, it clearly says that Jesus called as a high priest because God appointed him. When we look at the book of Hebrew, it is clearly mentioned Jesus, uh, Jesus called as he is a high priest. He is the link between uh, he is the link between um, uh, the the uh, peop, uh, the people and the God. And the second one is blood sacrifice. Blood is similar content in the both covenant. Uh, burnt offering, sin offering, guilt offering normally choose an uh, animal blood and sprinkle the blood in the altar. This is the normal procedure in the Old Testament sacrifices. In the New Covenant, Jesus willing, fully sacrificed himself, means he gave his own blood for our salvation. In the both, in the both covenant, the blood is the common thing. In the uh, Old Testament covenant, the animal's blood is using, to, using for the sacrifice. When it comes to the New Testament, Jesus' own blood. But Blood is the common content. Uh, the third point is sacrifice outside the camp. Within the some of the Levitical sacrifice, we see that the part of the procedure involved taking the sacrifice outside the camp and burning the sacrifice there. According to the author of Hebrew, this particular act within the sacrifice foreshadows the sacrifice of Christ outside the camp. How? The day of atonement, the Yom Kippur, 
the in the levites and the uh, they sacrifice the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the guilt offering whose the blood was brought to make the atonement in the holy place and the other part shall be carried outside the camp their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burned within the fire mostly they took took the skin of the animal skin and other part usually the burn outside the camp so the grave was the offense that the part of offering would give to be burn outside the camp what then the lesson and implication of his sacrifice burn outside the camp according to the hebrews christ also suffered outside the camp in the book of hebrew the camp refers the city of jerusalem since our lord was crucified outside the city the other the paul is trying to show the connection between the camp and the city of jerusalem you know the both the both things carried outside here in, in the old testament covenant jesus was crucified he was suffered he was struggled in the outside the city of jerusalem jerusalem symbolically symbolically the other put jerusalem as the camp um can i say uh, there is a, there is also a difference between new testament uh, new covenant and old old covenant the perfection of the sin status of high priest the mediator of the receptive covenant my first point is the sin status usually no uh, the high priest represent the men and women and the uh, and the nation of israel where their responsibility rep- is presenting the people gift and offering to the god high priest had present sin offering for himself as well as for his people in the old covenant high priest themselves need to uh, need to sacrifice because they are sinners they are not perfect this specifically during the day of atonement however the priest was limited in the role of his own sin in the old covenant the the, the high priest is not perfect he is not a perfect person he is a sinner that reason he must need to sacrifice himself in the new covenant jesus christ is our high priest and he is the son of god and he is sinless therefore he don't need to do the sacrifice we we already know that jesus christ is a sinless and spotless he don't want to commit any sacrifices but in the old testament or in the in the old covenant the high priest must need to sacrifice for for the for his own sins jesus christ is our mediator of the new covenant because jesus christ sacrificed himself he he sacrificed himself for our sin not he sin he was he was a sinless and spotless person but he sacrificed himself for our sin priest and sacrifice and priest sacrifice in the old covenant priest sacrifice the animals for cleaning the sins from the people for cleansing the sin from the people but there is no need for animal in the new covenant why there is no need for animal in the new covenant because jesus was symbolically represent the animal and he is also working as the high priest when it come to the new testament in the old in the old testament priest and sacrifice is a two different thing but when it come to the new testament jesus is both priest and sacrifice god the father is placed in the perfect life of son and his sacrifice jesus was a spotless lamb and this is what was required to overcome sin for all time isaiah said that please isaiah said that it pleased the father bruise the son and put him to the grief or grief as an offering his son is offering that would end all all other offerings uh, simply says that jesus christ became a um a sacrificing animal and he he was also become a high priest the but value of the blood in the old covenant and the new covenant what is the significance of animal's blood and jesus blood obviously jesus blood is spotless and he is a son of god but and also the effect of jesus blood is permanent 
because he is a spotless and he is a son of god animal blood is animal's blood is for only for the temporary cleansing it is not a it is not a solid or permanent solution because there is no animal is perfect animal blood can only remove the individual sins and only for some particular period but jesus blood can remove all the sins from entire humanity that the the past future and present that the, the time is not in uh, not influencing jesus blood because it is so powerful because he is a perfect person he was sinless spotless and also he is a son of god and my third point is okay so next is the superiority of melchizedek over levi so let us explore jesus's priesthood further uh, priesthood is not a new concept uh, it started since the old covenant time since the beginning general priests are required to come from the levitical lineage let alone high priest uh, although this levitical priesthood has run for many generations it has not been effective in causing god's people to be acceptable before god or in the author's word in uh, chapter 7 verse 11 it brings the law but it does not bring perfection jesus on the other hand is said to be a priest the high priest who does not come from the line of levi he is descended from the line of juda as a firm again uh, in verse 14 uh, by that jesus is not bound by any levitical traditions and limitations moreover hebrews attribute psalm 110 verse 4 to jesus thereby highlighting that jesus is the high priest in the order of melchizedek in contrast to that of levi so what is so significant about jesus being the high priest in the order of melchizedek melchizedek is indeed an enigmatic uh, character in the bible we first see his account in genesis chapter 14 where he blessed abram and abram gave him a tenth of everything he is the first ever person recorded in the bible who is both a king and a priest This at least gives us a precedence of a multiple office person, as well as a priest who is not a Levite. Furthermore, he is so puzzling a character since this is the only time he was mentioned the only in, in the Bible. He suddenly appeared and he suddenly stopped appearing, or in, in other words, disappeared until Hebrews. Until in Hebrews. In Singaporean term, we will call him a person who has no head, no tail, and that calling is appropriate, as Hebrews call him in verse in chapter seven, verse three, that Melchizedek is without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. The bottom line, he is eternal. By relating Jesus to Melchizedek, Hebrews imp- implies that Jesus is eternal and is indeed the high priest forever. In contrast uh, to Jesus, uh, as mentioned in uh, chapter seven, verse twenty-three, the priests of old are many. Uh, why? Not just because there are several of them at the same time. but also because they die and need to be replaced the issue with priesthood that keeps on changing is that there is no consistency in the things related to the priesthood especially when we are talking about human priesthood with all the human weaknesses and sinfulness changes in priesthood result in complications and lack of assurance not only does jesus's eternal priesthood give consistency it also allows assurance because jesus is the sinless and perfect high priest and since he always lives to make intercession for them for us we have discussed this in class that uh, chapter 7 verse 4 to 10 talks about how melchizedek is more superior than levi in a tongue in cheek manner in summary the most superior is melchizedek the second most superior is abraham next is levi and the last is the rest of israel because abraham paid tithes uh, to melchizedek and melchizedek blessed abraham melchizedek is more superior than abraham 
And because when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, Levi was still in Abraham's loin or in Abraham's crotch, sorry to say. Uh, Levi also indirectly paid tithes to Melchizedek through Abraham, implying that Levi is in the third order of superiority below Abraham and certainly below Melchizedek. Jesus being the high priest in the order of Melchizedek indicates that his priesthood is more superior than the old covenant priesthood uh, of, of the Levites. Chapter 7, verse 15 to 16, tell us that in the Old Covenant, priests can only come by physical descent uh, from the tribe of Levi. It is illegal, perhaps an offense, to consider anyone who descended from the tribe of Judah to be a priest, let alone a high priest. But here we are faced with the proclamation that Jesus is the high priest. Interestingly, Hebrews contrasts physical descent with the power of an indestructible life. How big the power of an indestructible life. Uh, Liam will help us to make it clear later what it means by the power of an indestructible life. But meanwhile, verse 20 clarifies for us that it at least refers to an oath. So what oath? One oath reference in this particular passage is Psalm 110 verse 4 again. Uh, that shows how important Psalm 14 verse 4 in this uh, in this. Uh, Topic of covenant, in fact. While other priests took the office of priest without an oath, Jesus became a priest by an oath by God himself who appoints Jesus as a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And in this oath given by God himself, we know that we have a better covenant because chapter 6, verse uh, 16 to 20 tells us that this oath is anchored on the unchangeable character of his purpose. Because Jesus became the high priest by God's own oath, Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. Chapter 8 is, uh, yeah, then the next point, the next difference is sanctuary and tent. Chapter 8 is interesting in that it compares and contrasts the sanctuary and tent that we have here on earth particularly in the time of Israel between the wilderness and the temple with the sanctuary and tent in the heavens. Hebrews calls the sanctuary and tent on earth to be merely a sketch, shadow, and pattern of the real one. This does not mean that it is unreal or false. It is there physically because God commanded it to be, to be built, but that it is merely a replica of the better and perfect. Meaning, when we see the replica, we should not put our trust in the replica, but rather in the real one that the replica represents. So, where is this real thing? They are in the heavens. It is very likely that Moses was shown this real one as the reference when he was asked to build an earthly sanctuary and tent. The real one in the heavens is called true, greater, and perfect. In fact, uh, Jesus our high priest is in there right now, not year by year, but for all time. So what is wrong with the earthly sanctuary and tent that we should put our hope in the heavenly one? Mm. Chapter 9 tells us that the sanctuary and tent on earth, together with all their cultic systems, cannot affect the conscience of the worshippers. What does it mean? It simply tells the worshippers of do's and don'ts but does not transform them. In contrast, the perfect sanctuary and tent in the heavens has been achieved for us by the blood of Jesus, which purifies the worshippers' conscience by transforming them. Therefore, for those who are looking forward to the heavenly sanctuary and tent, their conscience is being perfected by the blood of Jesus, which has started to take effect when they put their trust in Jesus. Furthermore, since the earthly sanctuary and tent stores the law tablet, uh, chapter 10 verse 1 tells us that the law is merely a shadow of the good things to come. The law itself does not contain the good things. Rather, through the law, the worshippers can get a glance of the coming good things. So where are the good things? The reality of the good things is contained in the heavenly sanctuary and the tent where Jesus performs his priestly works 
as he is interceding for us, even now. No wonder it is called true, greater, and perfect. And it does flow well that this perfect sanctuary and tent also makes the worshippers perfect by the blood of Jesus. Uh, I would like to say about earthly Mount Sinai and heavenly Mount Sinai. This is one of the, these two things is so similar, but it's, but it's quite different. I would like to say about how it is different. The Mount Sinai is the place of Moses received the Ten Commandments and represent the law. We already know that the Mount Sinai, the Moses received the law from the God. The Mount Sinai represents the law and the works. And Mount Sion represents the God's amazing grace. It, uh, it represents Jesus' blood paid for our sins and we may be forgiven and saved. But it, this both, these two things have quite different, quite different because one is represent fear and the other one represent the grace. The Mount Sion represents heaven. The Mount Sinai is the replica and it, is, it, it recures the perfection. The Mount Sinai, it is only a, only a replica. And it needs perfection. Uh, Mount Sinai is pointing out coming Mount Zion. In Mount Zion, Jesus Christ is waited for us and he already completed all work for us. But when we look at the Mount Sinai, Israeli, when Israelites at Mount Sinai, Israelites feared because they are not perfect. But when we look at the Mount Zion, the people feel more happy and th there is a hope because Jesus completed all work for us. Therefore, we don't need to enter for, uh, there, we don't need to fear for entering Mount Zion. And the second one, and the most important part is the heart. The NAD already mentioned that. The Liam will explain that. I would like to say about, you know, the heart, the power of the power of the indestructible, indestructible power. It is also mentioning the book of Hebrew, chapter 8, verse 10. And the, uh, in the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, the chapter 31, Verse 34, the same thing, the same oath, the same, uh, same hope God is giving, uh, uh, giving to us, the hope carrying indestructible power of life. In the book of Hebrew, chapter 8, 10, the other mentioning about the oath is already mentioning in the book of Jeremia. In the book of Jeremia, God promised to the Israel to an oath. That is, I, I would like to say, I would like to say that God. I would like to say the verse. After those days, say the Lord, I will put my law in their inward part and write in their heart. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. This oath has indestructible power of life because it's mentioning God people never be destroyed. It is giving the, it is giving the one of the ultimate hope in the Bible. You know, this, this, uh, this same oath is also mentioning in the book of Hebrew, uh, Hebrew chapter 8, verse 10. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities. I will be, I will be their, uh, I will remember their sins no more. God give a hope. God also give a, uh, God also give a solid promise. In the Old Testament covenant, the laws was in the tablet and we are forcefully following these laws in order to get the salvation. In the, old, in the old covenant, the people struggled to follow the laws because it was not written in their heart. They are only focusing and, and they are only trying to obey the law forcefully because they need something. But laws, laws, laws not in their heart. That is an issue. But in the New Testament, uh, but in the New Covenant, God write the law inside our heart through Jesus Christ. Now we are we are following Jesus Christ and obeying Him because we love Him. We are not forcefully obey the laws, but we are obeying Him because we are obeying Jesus Christ 
because we love him but that my ultimate point is the law in the old covenant the law was not returned in their heart but in the new covenant law was returned in our heart and the second point is we are not forcefully obeying the law we are happily we are joyfully obeying obeying the law because we love jesus christ okay so now having compared and contrast uh, the old covenant with the new covenant the million dollar question is then if the new covenant is so good why did god bother with the old covenant why not straight away uh, go with the new uh, there is no straight forward answer to this question unfortunately uh, to a certain extent uh, it is a divine mystery however there is uh, yeah one passage that that can hint us to the answer to that and we can also look at a few other parts of the new testament to find the answer firstly we have learned that the replica is pointing to the better one that is the real one and hence the old covenant worshipers are supposed to hope in the real one in the future not in the replica that they already had secondly chapter 10 verse 3 tells us uh, that this replica is a reminder of sin year after year and this idea corroborates with romans 3 verse 20 that says through the law comes the knowledge of sin romans 4 15 the law brings wrath Rom- romans 7 uh, verse 7 if it had not been for the law i would not have known sin and galatians 3 verse 19 it was added because of transgressions in summary the replica reveals to us that we are sinners uh, the bottom line is this uh, the law is is not bad it is good but it requires perfection and in failing to fulfill the perfect requirement of the old covenant old covenant worshipers are supposed to trust in god for their deliverance particularly in the good things to come that god himself has promised in other words Old covenant worshippers are expected to put their hope in the real one, which in in the case of the old covenant worshippers refers to Jesus. However, this also applies to the Christians addressed in Hebrews, in that as they are faced with persecutions, they are to continually hope in the perfect sanctuary and tent that is to come, where Jesus is interceding for Christians, for them, for us, even now. Quoting Paul Washer, uh, he says, "It is only against the pitch blackness of the night that we see the glory of the stars, and it is only against the pitch blackness of man's radical depravity that we can begin to see the glories of the gospel. In other words, it is only against the pitch blackness of the effects of the from the old covenant that we see the glory of the hope in the new." And then, so learning several, uh, you know, knowing that new covenant is uh, way better than the old covenant, there are some implications for Christians that uh, Liam uh, will start. Uh, I would like to start from uh, faith people, people works with faith people plus work Christ faith alone. In the old covenant. the people mostly depends upon their own work because they they need perfection in order in order to get salvation when it come to the new covenant we need to put trust in jesus christ because he perfectly fulfill the work for us means he sacrificed himself for our sins and we only need to trust him but we are also responsible to do the good works because we love jesus christ exactly we are not we are not doing the good works but still we need to good works because we are loving jesus christ and the second implication is um, oh sorry okay then the second one is uh yeah the, the non applicability of the 10 commandments for christian okay so if the new covenant is superior to the old covenant so what so let us first see these verses that talks about this uh, a change in the law Uh, abrogation of an earlier commandment need to look for a second one made the first one obsolete 
and will soon disappear. And he abolishes the first in order to establish the second. There is even an illustration about a will uh, in order to establish the second. Um, yeah, sorry, there, uh, uh, sorry, there is even an illustration about a will that will take effect only at death of the first one, which mirrors a similar point as Paul's uh, Romans 7 verse 1 about the extent of the binding of the law. So we realize that this is controversial because in famous catechisms, the Lord's Prayer is the representative of the core New Testament Christian teaching, and the Ten Commandments is the representative of the core Old Testament Christian teaching. Even Calvin, John Calvin, categorically defends that only ceremonial law is abolished. But we contend categorically that Christians are no longer under the Ten Commandments. Anyway, who here still consecrates the Sabbath day? Just tongue in cheek. Okay. Uh, before going further, let us nuance it by saying that it does not mean that Christians can commit idolatry, murder, or adultery. Instead, Christians are under crisis commandments, which covers much deeper and wider requirements than those of the Ten Commandments, while altering the point on Sabbath from a specific day into a holistic rest in Christ, which we hope will be discussed by another group or individual in our class. Matthew 5 verse 17 tells us that Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Therefore, when faced with the Ten Commandments, Christians should not approach it with the mentality of wanting to obey it because not only we are no longer under the old covenant, but also it undermines the fact that Jesus has fulfilled them. Instead, we propose that Christians should approach them as something that has been fulfilled by Jesus and that Jesus has given us a new set of commandments. Jesus' commandments are fewer, but not easier than the Ten Commandments. Not only it is harder, it is impossible, hence requiring faith in him to be counted as righteous. We should not murder because Jesus has commanded us to love our neighbors. Not only we should not murder, we also should not hate because we are commanded to love. And this is exactly why Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 to 30, so does, does it mean uh, that it was meant to burden the original recipients that you have, they have no hope? Uh, what, was, what was the encouragement to them then? So the encouragement is to not return to the old covenant that has been obsoleted. Now, by yourself, it is impossible. So trust in Jesus. That's the point. Trust in Jesus. Yeah, and... The third implication is covenant community of only regenerates. All right. I'm, I'm thankful that I can share this in the Baptist seminary so I don't get much pushback, I hope. All right. Another significant uh, implication is this. Chapter 8, verse 11, and Jeremiah uh, chapter 31, verse 34, confirm to us that new covenant community comprises the people whose minds and hearts have received God's law written therein, and who know the Lord. New covenant community is one that is not by physical descent, but by an oath by God that produces the power of an indestructible life. In other words, the church consists only of regenerated people. A uh, fourth implication is, uh, if you are Christian, if you are following Jesus Christ, we need to face many things. We are, we are an outcast community by the world. According to the Hebrew chapter 13, verse 13, let us then go him outside the camp and be a abuse and he endured. Jesus Christ suffered outside the camp. As a followers of Jesus Christ, we will also outcast, outcasted by the communities. Consider this word, Christians are, Christians are still being an outcasted community because of our values and moral standard different from the world. It is easy, it's not easy to live where life 
according to the bible we need to pay for that christianity encourages believers to living according to the standards of bible and that is entirely different from this world persecution also part of outcast and the christians are experiencing experiencing sins from the first century if we look the history of christianity we know that christians are persecuted by the roman emperors but still it's following still it's it's going on in different ways we are living in singapore we are enjoying ourselves we are going to sunday church that does not means the entire world the christians are living like that in most of the western countries christians are not persecuted but christians usually choose to maintain a separated lifestyle but other part of the world the scenario scenarios entirely different many christian missionaries killed by their religious by other religious extremists especially the countries like pakistan and india in india converted Christ- christians considering as an outcasted people and they mostly persecuted and killed by their own family members what was happening in jesus life it is also reflecting all over the world i am also mention uh, before i mention that we are living in the comfortable zone that does not means all over the world is following this kind of scenario some christian uh, some countries christians are persecuted in different manner means the government considering them as a second class citizen in most of the countries such like pakistan like pakistan the christians are considering as a second class citizen but persecution never destroyed christianity instead it helped to flourish when we look at the history of christianity uh, even though the first, the early church went through many different kinds of situation many different kinds of struggles the roman emperors couldn't destroy the power of the power of the christ church started to flourish even though they are facing different kinds of discrimination different kinds of persecution from the communities finally we are also having the responsibility to persevere i want to pointing out one particular word one specific word that is persevere the situation uh, the persevere persevere the situation christians because christians are not survivors we are born to become an overcomers not because of our own sake because of our cra- god's power of offering sacrifices my fifth uh, fifth impl- implication is offering sacrifices one of the main theme of book of hebrew is clear that in the new covenant a new covenant had come and replaced the old covenant the new covenant is much superior to the old it has better hype big why why it is much greater much superior it has a better high priest a better atoning sacrifice the new covenant had a better promise better promise means i mentioned the indestructible power of life and better altar as well as better tabernacle in all respect superior to the old in all respect this make the new covenant this give the new covenant to a great superiority because jesus himself sacrificed for us and his and this sacrifice is enough for our salvation but we still need to sacrifice what is that according to the hebrew uh, ch- uh, chapter 10 verse 11 told uh, then chapter 13 verse 15 and 16 still we need to do the sacrifice not the blood sacrifice but god expecting the sacrifice of praise means the fruit of our lips that is openly prophesy his name you know god is expecting our praise the praise is also considering as a sacrifice in the new covenant in the old covenant the blood is most prominent when when it come to the new covenant our praise god is expecting our praise but it is not the end we also have a responsibility to share the good with others we need to live a life for god these sacrifices these sacrifices god expecting from his own people because we are under the new covenant we need to do the good work we are also responsible to praise him that is that is called uh, with god is expecting the pr- praise from our lips to openly prophesy his name Mm. thanks
in, con in closing, uh, the new covenant is the superior covenant that is mediated by the superior high priest in the superior sanctuary and tents and on the superior Mount Zion. And therefore, Christians are to live by faith in Christ, especially in the midst of persecution, and do good works, uh, not as a means to enter into the covenant, but rather as the expression of being already in the covenant. Thank you. Thank you.